Before this episode begins, which is at dawn, we have a nighttime scene from Expose. Paolo travels from the beach camp, through the jungle and goes to the waterfall. He grabs the black bag he found that contains the diamonds. We don't know when he hiked, possibly during the evening, while everybody was mourning the death of Shannon. Paolo went and grabbed it, and walked the beach back. By now it is night time. Nice night. Locke approaches him and suggests he hide his secret somewhere more permanent than the eroding beach. Whether or not Locke is on his way to the hatch or has already been there, we don't know. The button is covered nonetheless since Jack and Kate are down there, tending Sawyer's wounds. We see Jin and Sun wake up together. Said digs a grave for Shannon. Jack sends Kate away to find some fruit for Sawyer. She sees a black horse. There's a few theories on that one, I can present the three options and you can choose the one you like the most. Number one, it is the man in black. Posing as the horse, trying to trick Kate away from Sawyer, who is on the brink of death anyway, or trick her in another way. Kind of like him appearing as Christian Shepherd to Jack in season one. Meaning that he observed Kate, transformed to a horse and ran off. This is reminiscent of a Kelpie from Scottish folklore which is a shape-shifting spirit that is a black horse that can shape-shift to a human. It can show itself to the sick, the lame, or those simply seeking to cross through shallow water untarnished. Their prey sees a beautiful, abandoned horse, and they approach it hand outstretched to ride. The motive of these creatures differs depending on the tale, but usually the goal of a Kelpie is companionship, murder, or oftentimes both. Physical contact with any part of them binds their flesh to the person touching, meaning there is absolutely no escape from a Kelpie once fallen into their trap. The power to transform has also led to other ways that the Kelpie can murder its prey. The creature can become a brutish hairy man that kills its victims by crushing them in a vice-like grip before taking them into the water. It can become a beautiful naked woman and trick lusting men into swimming with it. Option two. It is just a coincidence, just like Saeed seeing the same breed of cat at the flame, which appears in his flashbacks in that same episode. I mean, we know that horses are on the island anyway. Option 3. It's the island. This one is kinda tied to the previous points. He's not attacking Kate, but is a calm presence. The island is leading a real horse or a shared vision of a horse to Kate, tying into the magic box that is the island, testing and helping them. The showrunners have goofed around with it. I think that Ben quite clearly says, let me put this into terms that you can understand, John, which in, in, in knowing that they have some sort of file on Locke and they they refer to having n n knowledge of the fact that he worked in a box company, that maybe this is just some sort of uh, metaphor that Ben is using to explain uh, whatever this box construct is on the island. Because I think it would be sort of silly to walk to the middle of the island and there's like kind of a big, large refrigerator box sitting there and Kate's horse comes tromping out and Saeed's a little cat and Jack's dad and... You know, I don't know, that would be kind of the worst idea in the history of ideas. I took it as representing she was free. Horses are a widely known symbol for strength, freedom and grace. However, this one is black, something that can have negative connotations and can connect it with the man in black or Kelpie. This horse gave her freedom in her past and on the island when she was finally free from the baggage. You see, I think Kate rode horses when she was a child and credits to the set dressers for putting out small details like that. The camera here moves past this shelf at Kate's house right before she puts Way to bed. There's a magic box here, horse miniature and a riding trophy. A nice escape from reality. That was the life at home with Wayne. Now back to the episode. She returns to the swan, to the main entrance, to attend to Sawyer and the computer, so Jack can attend Shannon's funeral. I love this shot here. Someone has so much free time that they have washed and dried the Dharma jumpsuits. On the beach, Echo comforts and Alicia, who is making her own tent. The group bury Shannon. Kill me. Why did you kill me? Sawyer seems to channel the spirit of Wayne Jansen, asking why Kate killed him and attempting to choke her. This is an interesting situation since it only happened once in the entire show and it is unanswered but it ties into the supernatural aspect that J.J. Abrams and Damon Lindelof liked. 
the um, you know Twin Peaks was a huge um, impact on on me, and I, I would watch it with my dad. And when the show was over, we would talk for like two hours about what the hell just happened. Almost as if it was influenced by Twin Peaks, a giant inspiration for Lost. To me, there is at least two strong possibilities. One, Sawyer was delirious, just like when Claire said Charlie when she woke up after the house exploded, or when a drugged out son called out for Jin in Jiyeon. Maybe for a second, Sawyer was rambling and thought he was in the same room as the bearded man from the raft. He was possibly half dreaming about himself getting shot on the raft and getting killed. Kate interprets it as her father. 2. The island has an interesting way of dealing with characters when they are unconscious or when their mind is somewhere else. Heck, even Sun lost the ability to speak English when she was knocked out in the package. So something weird happened to Sawyer while he was almost on the brink of death, like in between places. I saw him when I was between places. He said that you would come and see me. He said that even though you were pretending you were a good man, Maybe the island used an unconscious Sawyer to communicate with Kate at that moment. And Wayne probably was a lost soul, unable to move on. Kate is scared and she runs from the swan station and into the jungle, leaving the hatch unmanned. Locke and Jack return to find the alarm going off nearly at the end of its course and Sawyer unconscious on the floor. Let's go back to the jungle. Juliet and Ben, wearing their hillbilly attire, go to the Pearl Station. Paolo is heading this way, which is bad timing for him. He hides in the bathroom. We can gather a few things from the conversation. My previous episode included this scene from The Other Woman. Shepard's file. Mikhail dropped it off. He's a spinal surgeon, Ben. He has extensive experience in tumor removal. Ben and Juliet know about Jack. Some days pass and they check the security cameras and see that Jack is still in the swan station. Already now, Ben is laying down the pieces. He'll use Michael to get to Jack, Kate and Sawyer. Later this day, someone will contact Michael on the computer. Two days from now, Michael will run off and encounter the others. Five days after that, Ben will be on his way to the swan station. So from now on until this, he has one week to figure out his plan. Ben and Juliet leave, but forget their walkie-talkie. Paolo takes it and leave. Charlie meets Kate in the woods. This looks like the area right near the beach camp, so she probably went there and was heading back to the caves as confirmed by Charlie later in the episode. It's still the best source of water and people are coming and going there with water bottles. Charlie, you seen Kate? Uh, a little while ago in the jungle. She was acting kind of barmy asking me about horses on the island. Jack asks Charlie about her, and then find Kate in the jungle, I guess some place outside the caves. Without warning, Kate kisses Jack and runs back. Jack goes to the beach and presumably asks Sun to be with Sawyer. He heads to the woods near the camp to chop some wood. Paolo is coming back from the Pearl Station. In an off-screen scene, Michael heads to the Swan Station with Jin and possibly Sun too, since Sun will be tending Sawyer. Jin doesn't know the entrance yet, so I guess Michael shows him. When they arrive, Locke gets the toolbox and uses bolt cutters to finally remove the handcuff Jin has worn on his right hand. Michael is checking out the blast doors. Like in case of an explosion, they come from the ceiling. A guy down here, uh... Desmond? Yeah, Desmond. He didn't tell you about these, what they're for? No. He asks if Michael wants to see the orientation film. Echo wants to watch it as well. Locke goes to the pantry and brings the projector, makes himself a cup of coffee while Echo and Michael sit down in the living room. They watch the film. Echo stands up and walks away. We will learn that he is gonna get the Bible found in the arrow. I think he either goes to the bedroom to retrieve it or back to the beach in case he has already made himself a tent. Locke and Michael go back to the computer dome. Locke demonstrates to Michael that the keyboard only works when the alarm sounds. In an episode later in the series, we know that it is technically not true. If you type really fast, you can break through the normal program and enter a chat mode. Hello again. Hello. 
Echo calls Locke aside and reveals a hollowed out Bible, which contains a small reel of 16mm film. Kate comes back to the hatch and enters the bedroom. Ah, see someone has ironed the Dharma jumpsuit and hung it up. Was it Sun? Probably. Kate relieves her. Following Kate's confession, Sawyer wakes up as his normal self. At the same time, Locke and Echo are in the computer dome. At some point, one of them enters the code, since the timer was at 24 minutes when he talked to Michael, and then 51 minutes at the end of this episode. Kate brings Sawyer out through the airlock. Outside the hatch, they see the black horse. Echo and Locke put in the film again and watches it. Honestly, I think the missing clip is a bit anticlimactic, and it was hyped up a lot when the show aired. We expected some major earth-shattering revelations, since this episode was the final one before the winter break. So why did Radzinski cut out this and travel to the Arrow with it? The portion he cut out was about communication with other stations being forbidden. After several years of isolation, Radzinski might have realized that this wasn't the right choice for the station. He probably communicated with low of stations, even very likely ordered new stuff like the washer and dryer. By communicating with the flame, who then could send an order outside the island. That's my two cents on the matter. The information in the missing clip is not relevant. Michael is in the computer dome and someone starts to chat with him, someone claiming to be Walt. It's been debated whether or not this was Walt. If we take outside sources, the showrunner's word for it, then yes it was Walt, as confirmed on the season 3 Blu-ray bonus feature, access granted. Yeah, we can say that was Walt on the computer. Yeah, he's a good typist. But he, he might has not exceptional typing skills. Or he might not have even needed a computer. I mean, when you have psychic powers, maybe you just think about the internet and you start IMing people. However, if you don't want to use the showrunner's words and analyze the show in itself, then you can either say, one, it was Walt, at some point in his captivity, either at the Hydra or somewhere else. Walt found a computer and managed to contact his father. Two. It was Walt, but he didn't use this computer. Like the showrunners inferred, he might have used his same communication powers and instead of projecting himself towards Shannon like he did earlier, he managed to control his powers and contact his father through the computer. 3. It was not Walt, it was the others. There are already cameras in the station and they waited until Michael was alone in the computer dome to contact him. I'll get back to this in the next episode and the episode The Hunting Party. That's all for this week. Stay tuned for the 23rd Psalm and please subscribe for more Exploration.